Welcome to the Clarity Advisor Show, where you'll learn how to grow your team today. Join Ken Trubke and his guests as they discuss what works and doesn't work to grow your team in today's world. And now, your host, Ken Trubke. Hello, and welcome again to the Clarity Advisor Show. When a business is sold, it can create a lot of anxiety and challenges for both the existing team and the new owners. Communication is critical to making sure the transition is as smooth as possible so the business can continue and grow. My guest today, David Nemus, is an entrepreneur and an active business investor who's been part of several acquisitions. He also has a background in business turnarounds and spent some time consulting with the FDIC on bank closures. So with that, welcome David Nemus. David, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ken. Good to see you again. All right, so um, t- the bank closures is super interesting. I want to get into that. It's also a very timely topic, but bring us up to speed on kind of where you started and how you got where you are and some of that journey. Yeah, so I uh, grew up in the Detroit area, went to Miami of Ohio for school and then moved to Chicago. Uh, went into public accounting, realized that wasn't quite my bag, we'll call it. So I kind of switched to a little bit of a consulting role there. Uh, took a little time off, went to Breckenridge uh, to ski for a little bit. I'll call it my quarter life crisis. Uh, came back and rejoined the firm that uh, one of the partners left. We did public private partnerships uh, consulting. And uh, one day we got a phone call that uh, we had the contract to close banks, which we didn't actually know we had. And we went from six of us to 300 of us overnight. So I, I did like planning of bank closures. So I would come in six weeks before and plan it and close it. Uh, after that dried up, I had started an e- online company, an e-commerce company, two of them in light bulbs and hardware. Uh, we decided to move to Grand Rapids, which is where we're at now, because uh, I was running those businesses from home. And then I got a call again from the FDIC to get pulled back in because they had some issues with uh, some things related to post failure. Um, So that got me back in the consulting world. um, And then I joined a firm here uh, that was a turnaround restructuring firm. And that was in the mid 2000s or or 2010, 2013, Um, became a partner there. um, And then in 2020, uh, I left to purchase companies. I had already purchased uh, Tolman's Meat, with some partners uh, about four and a half years ago now. And then uh, I joined some liquidators. We bought some businesses. Uh, one of those that we maintain is a commercial bakery. Uh, and I'm actively looking at deals and I do some consulting uh, in the arena of transactions or, or transitions and trouble. So excellent. That's where I'm at. Okay, good yeah. deal. And I do want to get to that banking stuff. But for now, uh, talk about the the acquisitions, what is it like to come in and work with that team? And, and how do you prepare for that? How do you work with the, the old owners as you transition to the extent you do? And then how do you work with that team to make sure that that's a smooth transition? I think a lot of it has to deal with empathy. Uh, and I don't mean like pity. I mean, understanding how other people think and, it, and approaching it that way, that everyone doesn't think the same and you have to understand how they think. So to get a transaction done, you can't just be like, this is how it's going to work. These are the numbers. This is how you're going to do it. We're going to buy it for this. And you must think this way. You have to understand what their goals and wants are as a seller or the position that they're in as a seller uh, and whoever those uh, kind of stakeholders around them, whether that's a bank or or employees, what they need and want or key employees. Uh, And so you build the transaction and then you build the transition around that. And so walking on day one, you know you're not the smartest person in the room. If you do think you are, then you're wrong. Um, And you just listen and you hear what they have to say. And then you kind of hope to build trust with them. And that's the goal is to build trust with anyone through that transaction. And then when you get in and and enable them to to do the right things and and build the business, you know, hopefully better or grow it or, you know, just kind of make sure everyone you got to take care of the people at the end of the day. You got to understand the people take care of them and they'll take care of the business and they'll take care of the customers. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Now you said day one is day one, the day that you're the owner and the old owners out or is day one before that. And, and how, well, I'm curious what kind of communication you have or are allowed to have with the team before it's a done deal. Typically, you know, there's 
exposure to a certain level of management, which is necessary. So, you know, it depends if it's brokered, don't love brokered deals, but if it's, you know, with an owner, you're building, you know, you're building trust with them, getting to know them, showing that you'd be a good steward of their legacy. And then they're hopefully going to open it up to key management members. So you can understand those people and how they think. And if they're going to be, you know, if you're going to work well with them. So some of that day one bleeds in, let's call it negative terms from day one. And the day one is when you walk in and you wave to everyone, you're like, hi, we're the new owners. And uh, it's always an awkward kind of moment um, because there's fear, there's fear and transition of anything. Uh, and so you just got to really be warm and, and tell them that it's going to be okay. And we're going to do the right things. And, and that's really day one because now it's on you before that it's all talk and maybe, maybe you're going to do it, maybe you're not, but on day one, it's your responsibility and you got to make it happen. And so the recourse is yours. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fair enough. So tell us some stories about things you've done well in those transitions and maybe some mistakes that you've made in communication in that transition, whether pre pre close or post close, uh, with the teams. But I, I, my mind just goes to what I've done wrong because that's, that's easier to understand you know, what I need to do better. Uh, one of the things that I've learned uh, is, you know, have some industry expertise that you can bring in with you, uh, whether that's just someone advising or the old owner sticking around. Um, but you need a plan for leadership transition. Um, and, you know, if, there, if the owner isn't there, I've had those situations, uh, one of late, where the owner was just not present, um, was out, and on day one was never there again wasn't even there on day one. Um, and so the key to that is to have someone who really understands the industry. I'm, I like to say I'm a mile wide and an inch deep on a lot of things. Uh, quick learner, but you know, there's nuance to every industry. There's nuances to every business and, uh, you know, not having those causes a lot more pain than having someone who says, that's how that works. And you're like, okay, now I know that. Um, so, you know, it's really having leadership having leadership that knows how it works uh, and, you know, bring, you know, if we go to art of war, bring, bring twice as much as you think you need, because nothing hurts more than either having to go back for capital or, or just kind of running skinny because you, because you just don't have it. And uh, it can cause pain, uh, but you can get through it and uh, you know, just work through kind of what you have and the facts that you have and deal with it. Right, right. In, in my experience coming in to companies as an advisor, it, it's helpful to build some kind of internal champions, people that you can count on to tell you what's happening, boots on the ground. Maybe they're leaders within the company formally or usually informally. They don't necessarily have a position, but they're, they've are they been around long enough or they just got the respect of the people, especially manufacturing. You get those shop floor leaders, unofficial leaders. And to have them on your side can be really helpful. Have you experienced that same thing where you come in and you've got to kind of get the support, build some support internally with a handful of critical people? Yes, 100%. I mean, it was more in the consulting days, I would say, just because you were going into new opportunities all the time. You were working with new clients and you had to get read in real quick in a lot of the situations I was dealing with. And I found that to be oftentimes the the people who understood the numbers at least were the right place to start and then the people who understood how things were made and how things were done uh to get them on your side and i guess that's that's the same of when you buy something but the the speed and in, in, in vigor in which you do that the pace and vigor i should say in which you do that in like a turnaround consulting role and what you do when you own it is quite different um when in the consulting days it was we you know a lot of people sit there with their hands, you know, kind of tied and they have good ideas that you're resource constrained and they understand where the bodies are buried and, you know, just picking their brain and saying, what should we do? I mean, a consulting, right? They borrow your watch to tell you what time it is. It's true, but really it's routing it through a different way and saying, no, this is what you should do. And all the people already know it, but no one's saying this is what we have to do. And there's a difference between that because that you can get stuck if everyone just knows the ideas, but no one takes action until you, if you get them to take action, it's the right move. So, you know, really 
I guess getting to know those people and either turn around or purchase is so key and getting them on their side and unlocking the potential that they have in their head and the potential that they can bring to the company. Yeah, absolutely. I, that kind of burning platform idea in a turnaround where like, guys, we got to move. Like mm-hmm. time is of the essence uh, yep. is, is often different than in a purchase situation. Although if you buy a company in distress, yep. it's the same. But I've definitely found that getting, uh, that, that, that like you said, the decisions need to be made. That it's mm-hmm. not necessarily that they don't know what to do, but having somebody come in with confidence and saying, yes. guys, this is the thing we're going to do. And now we're going to go do it. And people mm-hmm. will rally around that. You know, people are looking to be led well. And if you can come in and lead people with confidence, they'll follow. Uh, but yeah, it is kind of that, you know, borrow the watch to tell the time thing. It's not as if you're coming in with the answers. They have the answers. What they, what I found they need most is somebody to confirm the decision and then push to get it moving and right and then and rally it, the team around that right and it's just it's very easy to have inaction until you show them you know especially turnarounds like this is not going to exist if you don't make these decisions so either make them at least we're going to try if we are not successful we can pivot but if if we're we're not going to be su- successful doing nothing we're going to be successful doing something even if it's not exactly right, at least we're trying. And that brings actual hope because you say, okay, let's try this. Let's make this happen from a situation that's a down spiral. You can turn it into an up spiral because we're going to make this happen, team. We're going to give hope. We're going to bring this out of its spin and we're going to make it successful. That, that switch in the brain is super powerful and that can motivate people to, to jump through walls for you. And yeah. that, that's what you need. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, the phrase I, I've, I like to use is we can't steer a parked car. So let's at <laughs> least get the car moving. We can change direction. We can, like you said, pivot a little bit. We can you know, steer it if we're not going exactly the right way, but we've got us get moving. We, we can't right. do anything just sitting here. And especially in distress, part of the reason you're in distress, guys, is you stopped making decisions and you stopped taking action. And mm-hmm. to get out of distress, we're going to have to do something. So right. let's get going. If it's not exactly right, we can fix it, but we can't fix it standing here. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Good, good stuff. Listen, I want to get into that banking stuff. We'll do that on the other side of the break. So stay with us. You're on the Clarity Advisor Show, and we'll be right back with David Nemus. Is your business where you want it to be or on track to get there? Clarity Advisors helps business leaders improve communication and get your team aligned and engaged for greater success. We specialize in helping you streamline your sales and operating systems to improve efficiency and grow your profits. Call or text Ken at 616-822-2998 to have a complimentary 12-minute call to see what some clarity could do for you. Okay, welcome back to the Clarity Advisor Show. Today we're talking with David Nemus, a business investor and turnaround expert, as well as someone who has years of consulting experience with the FDIC working on bank closures. So David, let's jump into that. How did you get into that world and what were you doing? And and tell us about that. So I teased that a little bit earlier that uh, I was at this firm, six people, we got a call that uh, suddenly we had the contract to close banks one of four firms at the time, and we just ramped up. And uh, our responsibility as a firm was to deal with the loan portfolios of failed banks. Uh, So that process starts about six weeks out. Uh, The FDIC and the state regulator, whoever the regulators decides they're going to close. And so you plan the closure. So as a ripe 28-year-old, I got sent uh, all around the country to basically break down the bank portfolio of loans. So I was an Excel guy. And so... It was a rule they didn't really have and our firm thought it was a good idea. So I started breaking down banks uh, and then suddenly writing plans to close banks because that's kind of what it fed into. And then, you know, I did 20 of them, about five in, I was just writing the plan. And I was telling the executives that were going to take it over. This is how we're going to do it. This is what we're staffing with. This I, you know, this is the type of bank. Is it an ag bank? What are we doing? Uh, and I kind of flew around the country planning bank closures for a good two years or so. Um, just setting them up and, and working through them. It was fascinating. Um, just kind of your tip of the spear and you're just like, oh, this is what we do. And I would go to the closure uh, on the day of and 
you'd walk in and they'd have you in the parking lot uh, waiting and you get released and you'd go in and there's media there, there's cops protecting it. It's sort of a surreal event because wow. uh, we all fly in under fake, like we fly in under real names, but we check in our hotel under fake company names. There's like 300 of us depending on the size of it. And then we all just attack and put everyone, all the employees against the wall and say, you know, hey, there's, uh, you know, hands off everything. And then we'll start talking to them and working through it. But wow. And yeah. are you, did you do dozens, hundreds? I like did how many over 20, this period? 20 that I actually or 21 that I actually closed and 24 that uh, got punted in some way or no, or sorry, four, three or four that got punted and didn't actually close because they may have found a buyer off market. And really there was a the FDIC it markets a bank and they try to get someone to buy it, which is news now, right? Uh, if they don't, then they literally shut it down and mail checks to everyone in 30 days if you don't pick up your money. And then they sell off all the assets. Um, but they really love the structured transaction. And that's kind of into the next role that I did with the FDIC when I got re-engaged with them was dealing with the law share program, which is uh, what they help in... in get acquirer to buy a bank, they they help share in the losses. And so they say, okay, if you experience this level of loss, we'll pay you 80 cents in the dollar. This level will pay you 95 cents in the dollar. Uh, so I ended up going to DC because they had some issues computing those projected losses. Uh, I built a financial model while there that uh, sort of mimicked their software program they had built. Uh, and so I kind of spent a bunch of nights and weekends there. I was leaving my family, going to DC, working hourly. And I was like, I'm going to figure this out. And uh, so I built this model and it became 2012 or so. It became kind of the check digit for the FDIC for another eight to nine years on what their calculation related to loss share was. So it was sort of, again, surreal. I worked next to the White House. I was kind of this guy that people knew that just worked in a spreadsheet, but he was the guy to talk to. And I fly back to Grand Rapids and no one knew what I was doing. <laughs> wow. That is really interesting. Yeah, it's bizarre. <laughs> so the recent bank, SVB and uh, uh, First Republic, were both have lost share attached to their sales. So so it's getting back in vogue and talking to some folks over there. So we'll see what happens. Okay. Sorry, David. Lost share. You said both SVB and Republic have that. What is that again? So the acquirers got it. So the FDIC, when they close a bank, they put it into receivership. Uh, the FDIC is the receiver and they transfer it to a purchasing bank. Because there's not enough time to do enough due diligence to really know what they're getting, the FDIC entices the buyer by saying, if you experience losses, single family, non-single family, there's buckets. If you experience losses on these loans, we will pay you 80 cents on the dollar traditionally for those losses. So say you have a $100 loan and you experience a $20 loss, the FDIC is going to give you a check for 16. You have to absorb the $4. Uh, so to make it that they're basically transferring the assets and covering some of the risk for the acquirer, they enter loss share. So there's these long legal documents that I would turn that into Excel and understand them. And so there's different tranches and a lot of little nuances to it that uh, take an interesting model because you got to project future losses on these loss share agreements. And then you got to understand what the payments are and timing of it and discounting it. It was a lot. I forgot more than I know now. I think it was, it was <laughs> fair, a thing. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. And, and it doesn't necessarily have a lot to do with building and growing your team, but it oh. is so interesting and it's really timely because mm -hmm. it's these bank failures are in the news. It's interesting to know that someone like you was doing this kind of work years ago, over and over, 20 some times. So bank failures, even though they're not always in the news, aren't necessarily a new thing. Is that yeah. is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. And I think it, it, it does correlate because I think what I really was and what Excel allowed me to do compared to the, the model was I would take to management and be able to talk to them with clarity about what is happening, why these numbers look this way. And because I understood them enough because I had to build the model, compared to the programmers who kind of built it and they they couldn't take it to management and really explain things. So you had to be able to help them understand in a way that they could 
management because they didn't know how to program. They didn't understand the nuance. So, I mean, it was it was maybe leading from the bottom, if you will, but leading them to say this is OK because uh, so that they didn't have the feeling that, OK, what these what these people do with this program over here? You had to give them comfort that, um, yeah, you know, you understood it and that this is how it works. So it was it was a lot of team building from the bottom is what I would say. Right, right. Yeah, it's always communication. It's mm -hmm. always people in the end, even though there might be a complicated Excel model or some detailed financial programming, it's still the explanation and being able to communicate what it means and what decisions now we need to make getting back to you know, turnarounds and making decisions. It's, it's kind of that way everywhere, regardless of the technical nature of the business. Mm -hmm. So, so what have you learned in the couple decades that you've been doing business, acquiring things, investing in things, being a consultant, different places? What are some things that you've seen that work with teams and, and maybe some things that don't work with teams or things that have changed? Interesting. Um, you know, what I've learned is everyone thinks differently. You have to first understand how you think and what drives you and what drives your behaviors, your thoughts, uh, kind of what is you have to be comfortable in your own skin about who you are and how you operate and understand that not everyone's going to operate there. No matter what you try to force them to, people have different personality types. People think differently and you have to you get a greater response if you surround yourself with people who think differently than you. And you, you, you are able to work together. So the most important thing is, you know, there's, there's risks you can take. You better have someone on your team that is worried about risk because that will help you sort of understand some gating that you do. So that someone's like, yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. And you have to give them space to present that and not just try to be like a smartest person in the room or you're, you're going to just yell people down and things like that. You know, you don't, you don't learn anything talking, I guess at the end of the day. Um, so I think that's the real positive. Uh, and I think what I learned is the worst situations I've seen are, are people who have sacred cows who, who hold kind of that won't let, um, you know, won't let things go, want to be the smartest person in the room, have a ton of, I always said turnarounds were the fault of hubris and ego. That was where it all started. And it's people problem with the people solution. So if you can get rid of that, that's how you solve it. It's yeah, all over. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it makes sense to me. It, it seems like every situation I've been in somehow was rooted in people and behavior and communication. Mm -hmm. And when we solve that and improve that, then everything else kind of takes care of itself. Because it's never really like the machine was broken and we couldn't fix it or, right, the, or the, right. the numbers didn't work and we couldn't make them work. Like, that stuff takes care of itself when we're able to communicate and, and mm -hmm. work together and respect each other and respect each other's talents. I like the idea that you said you got to have somebody that is managing risk and that you want this diversity of thought and styles because it's together that we are more powerful and more capable. And when you want to be the, like you said, the smartest guy in the room, giving all the orders and directing all the traffic and making everything come and go through you just bogs down. And ultimately you can't be as successful as building an autonomous, capable team with diverse skills and experiences. So David, you've been doing business and studying business for a long time. How do you keep yourself sharp? Are there books or audio books that you're consuming or podcasts that you listen to, or how, how do you keep your game up to speed? Well, currently I'm reading a lot of call reports from banks, which are the FDIC issued financial statements, but uh, that, that's keeping me up and some analysis on that. But generally, I, I really like uh, Howard Marks, who uh, is with Oak Tree Capital, and they uh, are distressed investors and just the clarity of thought on kind of market timing, market cycles and, and you know, rational behavior and irrational behavior uh, that sort of fascinates me. Um, I, I like to buy for value. So I like to read things that sort of provide a lot of clarity down to the bottom, like a, like the um, Warren Buffett, their annual reports, just amazing for clarity because it simple is complex. And so I usually seek out people who can frame up things very simply, even though they're very complex matters, because I find that to be very brilliant. So um you know, I'm trying to think of some other books. Mystery of Capital I'm reading, which is a story of basically why, um, you know, why property rights matter, uh, how that creates economy and, and collateral. 
there was a book, uh, The Devil in the Hindmost, that I just listened to. That is uh, the story of bubbles, which I always find fascinating again because it tells the upside and the, the exuberance of a bubble and then the downside and how it spins, um, you know, goes negative very quickly and and kind of learning those and seeing those and and then, you know, applying that to the real world is kind of something I, I, I try to do and hope to do more in the future. So. And so I'm curious, are those FDIC reports, is that public information or are yeah. you getting like insider? No, uh, every bank's financial statements are published by the FDIC on a quarterly okay. basis. They released them yesterday. I don't have the aggregate yet dump out when I tried it last night, but I could poke around for a few things. So when SVB happened, I downloaded all of the bank information, ran my own stress tests uh, to try to understand kind of what, what we were dealing with. Um, and I did some posts on LinkedIn about that. So I probably have some homework this weekend uh, to deal with that, uh, to sort of work through what we actually have here. But it, there's fascinating, like uh, uh, First Republic had 70 billion of deposits roll out of it um, in from the end of the year to 331 and filled it up with other weird liabilities. And uh, so you see some really interesting and you can see the behavior movement when you look at it in bulk uh, of kind of what's happening in the market. And uh, and I'm, I'm looking at getting into buying a bank possibly. I've had a lot of conversations around that recently. So uh, I'm keying in on a few and, and talking with them and working with them. So, wow, that's really interesting. And I think you're right on point with the, especially the Buffett uh, reports that it's being able to take the complex and make it simple. It's not dumbing it down. It's simplifying it because that shows that greater level of understanding. Like when you really understand something, you can explain it in relatively simple terms. Mm -hmm. And my experience anyway, is when you don't understand something, you can't simplify it. And that's when you get people using a lot of jargon and corporate speak and talking in circles because they just don't understand things. Mm -hmm. so, Me marketing people. Sorry. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, with that, I will ask you, David, who should reach out to you besides other banking geeks? Uh, but who, who's, a, who's somebody that you, you know, should reach out to you and what would be the best way for them to get a hold of you? Um, so I'll give you my little speech and my three prong approach. There's capital, there's opportunity, and there's operators. I am not an operator. I help operators, you know, reach success. Uh, so operators who maybe want to buy a business, uh, but don't have the capital, uh, capital partners, they want to invest. Uh, I have some capital partners, uh, but you know, people with opportunities in transition. Uh, I mean, I love to be a great steward of legacy for an owner. Uh, and give them, you know, a, a check and allow them to go to the beach and still have some semblance of, uh, you know, relationship with the company and, and, and really live out their life and know that they're in good hands. Uh, I'm working on a long-term model for holding things, not selling things. Uh, so, you know, best, you can find me on LinkedIn, David Nemus, right there at the bottom. Uh, there's not many of us. Uh, and then I have a website called Business Code App Is, but best to find me on LinkedIn. Uh, try to connect, send me a little pithy message, and then uh, I might be slow to respond. Sometimes I ignore it, but I hope to get back to you. <laughs> all right, fair enough, and good disclosure. I like that. Mm -hmm. We'll have all your books and your contact information in the show notes okay. so people can, can reach out and find you there. So, David, as always, enjoy yes. talking with you and learning from you. The stuff that you get into, I find just fascinating mm -hmm. in your experience in business and banking and turnarounds. Uh, very interesting. I, I, I think it it's interesting to hear as detailed and maybe financial and complicated as some of this stuff is, that it still comes back to people, that it still mm -hmm. comes back to relationships and understanding and working with people. So I love, I love getting through that stuff with you. So thanks so much for making time to be here. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah, excellent. That was, that was a lot of fun. All right. Well, with that, we are at the end of another Clarity Advisor show. Please take a moment, if you would, to rate us on the platform you are listening or watching on. We always appreciate that. And we will see you next time here on the Clarity Advisor show. Bye now. Thank you for listening to the Clarity Advisor show. Clarity Advisors is a speaking, training, and consulting firm specializing in helping you simplify your sales and operating systems to improve efficiency and grow your profits. Connect with Clarity Advisors today to learn more about how they can help you improve communication, 
and get your team aligned and engaged for greater success.